bringing together voices in child and youth health care. This is CAFC Presents. CAFC would like to thank the following member organizations for their generous support of our knowledge translation activities. The IWK Health Centre, the Children's Health Foundation of London, McMaster Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario Research Institute, the Children's Hospital Foundation of Manitoba, the Montreal Children's Hospital Foundation, the Holland Bloorview Children's Rehabilitation Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital Foundation of Saskatchewan, and Trillium Health Partners. We would also like to thank the following Keystone and program partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of CAFC's programs and activities. If you have any questions or comments for our panelists, please type them into the question box at any time during the presentation. You can also share your thoughts and questions on Twitter by tagging at CAFC Tweets and using the hashtag CAFC Presents. All of our webinars are recorded and can be found on the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network. Use the CAN to share these recordings with your colleagues or register an account and post comments, links, or other resources that you think will be of interest. And be sure to sign up for the CAFC Presents weekly email newsletter to stay up to date with upcoming webinars and our recorded webinar archive. All right, hello everyone and welcome to today's episode of CAFC Presents. I'm Doug Maynard, the Associate Director at CAFC, the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers. And today we're going to be talking about critical incident stress management, a contribution to a healthy workplace. And it's my pleasure to welcome our team from Alberta Children's Hospital in Calgary, Alberta. And today we're going to be discussing their program to help address symptoms of PTSD and moral distress, compassion fatigue and burnout that we recognize as being far too common in an acute care setting. And they are going to talk about their program that they have developed at Alberta Children's to manage uh, those issues. So it's my pleasure to introduce the team from Alberta Children's. Uh, we have with us Renee Campman, who is the Quality Improvement Data Coordinator for uh, the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit and the ACH, the Alberta Children's Hospital CIS, CISM Team Coordinator at Alberta Children's in Calgary. Uh, Renee has predominantly been in the critical care uh, unit in and in critical care in the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit at Alberta Children's in various nursing roles. And she is the coordinator for the first site-wide CISM team in Canada, the ACH Critical Incident Stress Management Team. Uh, and with joining Renee is Emma Foles, who's the patient care manager for the pediatric intensive care unit, the neonatal intensive care unit, the neonatal follow-up clinic, and the RSV program at Alberta Children's Hospital. Emma has predominantly uh, also been in the neonatal and pediatric uh, critical care uh, world as a nurse and has worked in various pediatric health healthcare facilities in Australia, the, the United Kingdom, and Canada. So it's my pleasure to now hand the virtual podium over to Renee and Emma. Over to you guys. Hi, uh, welcome. Thanks for having us. Uh, today's topic, we're talking about critical incident stress management um, and how this um, program is a contribution to a healthy workplace. So I'll start by giving just a, a little bit of an introduction as to what CISM is. Um, so in the early 1970s, Dr. Mitchell developed uh, many of the crisis intervention procedures used around the world today. His work is the foundation of a broad spectrum crisis intervention program no, now known as critical incident stress management. He has authored over 275 articles, uh, 19 books in the stress and crisis intervention fields and serves as an adjunct faculty member to the emergency uh, Management Institute of the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Dr. Mitchell is a reviewer for the Journal of the American Medical Association and the International Journal of Emergency Mental Health. The United Nations has appointed him as an expert uh, consultant to the United Nations Department of Safety and Security Working Group on Stress. He actively teaches CISM and consults with emergency services, military personnel, hospitals, business and industries on a regular basis. So I kind of just put that up there. That's the basis of our um, training and where we've received our um, certification to uh, lead CISM tactics at our um, site here. So I would like to put out that um, question, I guess, in regards to if anybody has any uh, experience with or knowledge of critical incident stress management uh, programs similar to this. 
audience to uh, go ahead and click on the screen and just let us know if you've ever heard of a CISM, a crit Critical Incident Stress Management Service or Program, or, or something similar to that. Or have you heard of this as a, as a concept? And it looks like uh, about almost 60% have not heard of this as a service or program. 42% have said yes that they have heard of this. Awesome. Then I'm glad we're doing this talk. That's great. Um, and I guess the next question would be is if of those who have heard of CISM, if they have a, a type of service at their institution. Same thing. So uh, for those of you who have heard of it, uh, do you have something similar at your program, either a CISM program or, or something similar at your organization? All right, we'll close that off. And of those who have heard of CISM, 40% have said, yes, they do have something similar at their organization, and 60% have said they do not. Okay, that's good to know. Um, so I'll just carry on, I guess, and explain kind of a little bit more about CISM. So those of, the, the, of you who aren't aware of it, you'll get a little bit more knowledge. And... Um, We'll go from there. So there's two definitions for CISM. So the one main one is Critical Incident Stress Management. It's the title of a program. It's a comprehensive program uh, integrating many crisis intervention techniques that are designed to provide the most effective support for distressed individuals and homogeneous groups. It is designed specifically for the reduction and control of post-traumatic stress reactions among high-intensity and high-risk occupational groups, such as firefighters, law enforcement, uh, military and emergency and medical personnel. So the goal is to build resiliency and restore group cohesion and performance as quickly as possible after events so that you can face the next ones that are coming your way. Um, so that's kind of a definition of, of CISM. Just to give a bit of history, um, as I had stated, it, it really generated from uh, emergency personnel, uh, paramedics, fire, police, EMS. Um, and so this slide shows two different comparisons for uh, two plane crashes. Um, so definitely not healthcare related, but just a basis for where CISM originated. And so the first plane crash in 1978 in San Diego, you can see on the slide there was um, really not many CISM interventions used. It was very sporadic. And within that first year following that disaster, there was um, five police officers left uh, their profession. Uh, there was five in the fire department as well, uh, as well as a loss in paramedics of 15 in that first year following that incident. There was an increase in mental health services up by 31%. And then fast forwarding to a very similar plane crash in uh, devastation and size, there was, um, I think it was about 10, 12 years uh, later, the uh, CISM was widely used. There was many different uh, tactics being used. There was demobilization of the teams right at the site of the plane crash. There was hotlines set up for people to call in. There was follow-up done with individuals. And as a result, there wasn't a loss, any loss of police or fire. One paramedic left their um, profession in that year following that event. And there was only an increase of 1% uh, of mental health services being utilized. So it really just shows that um, effectiveness of a program like this following a disaster. So this uh, next slide coming up is going to really set the context for the healthcare setting as to what we're um, finding works in our centre. You're about to enter one of the most exciting fields of modern medicine. The advances in technology have increased our success rate in almost every aspect. What we do on a daily basis is nothing short of miraculous. The miracles we perform every day mean that 95% of the children admitted to the pediatric intensive care unit are eventually discharged. We have reason to be proud. Now, you'll hope for that miracle every time out. We all do. But when that miracle can't happen, when that child can't be saved, our job as healers continues. The entire family becomes our patient now. Dying with that child are all the hopes and dreams for their future. There is no stronger emotion than hope that a parent has for their child. 
you're going to be seen as the enemy, you will be seen as the agent of death. A parent can understand if you have to amputate a leg, if you have to remove a kidney, if you have to transplant a heart. But hope, hope is an organ, a vital organ, a fragile, vital organ. When this happens, and it does to all of us, I want you to think of it as a transplant. You're removing an old hope, a hope that can no longer be sustained. You need to replace that with a new hope, the last best hope that a parent can have for their child, the hope of a good death. If you can't handle the 5%, the joy you feel at the 95% will be crushed. If you can't handle the 5% loss, you will fail. You will fail your patient. You will fail your team. And you'll fail yourself. So going ahead and, and speaking of stress, which is really the big component for um, critical incident stress management, the uh, use stress is a good type of stress. So we need that. It's a positive type that can help motivate us and lead to uh, improved health and performance. Um, and it's really a, an example of healthcare workers because you need that um, drive. You're, you're usually working under pressure. Um, so that really helps you get the job done of, of your task at hand. Distress, uh, a negative form of stress, causes discomfort, pain, and even dysfunction. It may lead to the erosion of health um, and set the stage for disease. It can interfere with one's ability to perform their professional and personal tasks. So that would be... Um, kind of the stress that we're trying to answer to with this program and um, lessen the impact of that. Uh, when we look at the impact on the individual of all these different stressors, um, we look at it as a whole leading to compassion fatigue, which is a process depicted here on this uh, diagram. It shows how the compound effect of all of these experiences can lead to emotional distress, physical illness, and increased interpersonal conflicts for the individual both at work and with their families. Um, for example, it can show up at work as bullying, uh, interpersonal conflict between colleagues, poor attendance, and the appearance of disengagement. This can spill over into our personal lives where we may not be the best partners or parents that we know we can be. Um, compassion fatigue is described as a combination of physical, emotional, and spiritual depletion and is associated with caring for patients and families that are experiencing significant emotional pain. We as caregivers in a children's hospital come face to face with this situation on a regular basis. So there's three characteristics of a crisis. Um, the first one being the unusual um, or the usual balance between thoughts and emotions is disturbed. Your usual coping mechanisms fail. And there is evidence of distress, impairment, or dysfunction. A crisis can be any event that causes an overwhelming emotion, uh, emotional reaction to a powerful stimulus or demand. It is different for every group and for every individual. Some events on their own can create a crisis. Um, for an individual, but more so the cumulative effects of repeated exposure to them can lead to crisis. So this would be distress in its most extreme form. So moving on to uh, what we call the crescendo effect. Um, so this uh, term is really looking at the effects of that moral residue um, and how it just kind of can build from event onward. So it really is that feeling of futility that's described in that moral residue. Um, the new morally distressing situations remind us of our power, powerlessness in past situations and the crescendo builds feeling, um, you get that feeling of here we go again. And, uh, but you're leading into that next situation with that burden from previous situations that you maybe didn't um, deal with. 
when you look at the effects of this stress uh, kind of vicious cycle, really, in on the impact of the system. So when you look at it as an organizational level, um, you look at that kind of job dissat- dissatisfaction uh, leading to burnout, low morale, um, higher staff turnover, leading to staff shortage at times, and then just really um, inadequate staffing in many areas within the healthcare system. You also see um, occupational injuries, maybe um, high absenteeism. So 62% of clinical health care uh, s- staff in Canada report being exposed to a traumatic stressor at work. These are some examples um, of the types of situations that might um, bring about that those levels of stress in the acute care setting. Um, so death of an infant or child is always um, number one and can evoke those um, emotions, uh, even if it's not your first time being exposed to it. Um, code blues, trauma, child abuse, uh, more and more through our program, we're noticing the long-term effects, um, what we would term like a chronic patient, somebody that's in uh, care with us for an extended period of time, looking at the uh, difficult and abusive um, situations that sometimes happen with families, um, ethical and moral challenges as well when healthcare teams and families do not agree on a course. And we're seeing that more and more as medicine advances and we're able to do more This next video is going to show um, an example of a commonly experienced situation in pediatrics. You can give him a bed bath when he wakes up. Thank you. I really admire what you're doing. I'm not doing anything unusual. This is all unusual to you, isn't it? I mean, this technology... It's not what our community believes in, that is true, but we've been brought here and everyone is working very hard to keep my boy alive. You're very calm about it all. What will be, will be. If God wants him to get better, he will get better. If God wants to take him home, God will take him home. Yes, I will grieve, but he will be with me always. Sometimes I wish I had that kind of strength. But you are very strong. Not like that. I'm a fighter. I'm a fighter too. Just not for the same thing. They're going to want to do surgery, you know. And we will not let them. And they will take it to court. And they will get custody and it will all happen whether you want it to or not. The social worker explained all of that to us. I'm not pressuring you. I just want to understand. Why not give consent if it's going to happen anyway? You would feel more comfortable if we consented to something that we do not believe in. You believe the surgery will save him, but we believe he does not need to be saved. His beliefs are incompatible. That does not make you evil or me evil, but when you say you want what is best for my son, I believe that you mean it. But how can you know what is best for him? He is my son. I have a son too. Look. They could be brothers. They look so much alike. But they are not. No. No, they aren't. I know. Thank you. For what? Showing me the picture. It helps. You'll think about consent. No. He's not your child. So our team here at ACH uh, comprises of nursing uh, staff, respiratory therapists, physicians, spiritual care, uh, social work, um, and management. Um, We do want to try to answer out to every uh, discipline within our site um, to be able to offer the services because everybody feels it on a different level and within different homogeneous groups. With the expansion of our team, uh, we're now able to provide peer support interventions to all inpatient
areas, as well as that um, of the operating room, emergency department, um, the PICU, and the uh, NICU as well. Our team is multidisciplinary, so therefore we can truly answer to peers. Some interventions are provided for groups of the same profession. Sometimes we um, do a mixed group, depending on the nature of the event and the team involved. So for an example, in ICU, our team is very tight-knit, and that would be um, looking at our physicians that were involved, residents, nursing, respiratory therapists, as well as allied health involved in a case. Um, CISM peer support is not psychotherapy. So it's designed to provide early intervention to mitigate the negative effects of stress and work collaboratively with existing mental health support services. So if we can identify things early, um, hopefully it won't lead down the road of things like post-traumatic stress disorder. So as I had mentioned, it's a multi-tactic uh, system with C within CISM. So there's actually 11 different tactics. We're going to just discuss a few of the uh, main ones that we use at our site, and I'll give you a little bit of an example of, of different levels as to which one we when we use it. So the first one, pre-event planning, um, this really provides anticipatory guidance and enhances resiliency prior to exposure of an event. And it improves your overall um, crisis response because you kind of know what's coming uh, ahead of you. This helps maintain the health of the providers so the patient and families we care for gain from it as well. Um, assessment of those directly and indirectly exposed uh, to events to determine the need of intervention. So we would do this kind of ongoing. It might be actively happening during um, a case that we're looking at that might be causing uh, high levels of stress and then immediately after and within the few weeks to follow. So this is kind of an ongoing piece. Um, the next one, informational groups. This is more of a way to uh, use um, information to to provide it to staff with accurate information, providing updates during and ongoing event um, of, or a crisis, thereby decreasing anxiety and increasing the group cohesiveness. So really it's just a way to get that information out in a um, healthy manner and maybe ask answer some questions, but just really setting the stage so everybody knows what's going on. The next one would be an interactive group diffusing. So this uh, stage, this is more of a form of psychological first aid. It provides stabilization. It provides a way for uh, cathartic ventila ventilation to occur, uh, decompression, uh, and, and reduction of acute distress symptoms. So this is something done usually within eight hours of an event. Uh, we'd like to try to answer um, that to the just the immediate people affected before they leave shift maybe that day. Um, it just kind of gives them a little bit of support and outlet before driving home to their families and uh, not having to have that as a burden. The next one would be a critical incident stress debriefing. This is usually done anywhere from 24 hours after an event up to 72 hours, even as long as one to two weeks out we've done them. It really just depends on the circumstances and when it's identified that it, there's a need. Uh, the emphasis here is more on normalizing the symptoms and the reactions that are experienced by the group uh, in response to an abnormal event. So you actually need a little bit of time to assess that and see what the symptoms and reactions are. Um, what what people are, are feeling. This uh, form of group intervention also restores group uh, cohesion and improves performance and product productivity in a healthy manner. Um, individual crisis intervention. This can be done uh, during and after events if a group tactic can't be done at the time or it's done in conjunction uh, to reduce acute distress symptoms for you know, particular individuals that may be struggling immediately. Um, individual work is ongoing for CISM facilitators as a regular um, check-in with individuals is needed to complete an assessment and screening of the cognitive, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual do domains. And it provides um, an opportunity for us to be able to refer for further evaluation should it be needed down the road. So this is something that we don't um, track all the time as to how much is being done, but it is one of the most widely used uh, interventions in CISM. Although the majority of CISM team debriefing uh, sessions for healthcare staff are for those who have experienced a single adverse event, from time to time the team is asked to provide regular group check-ins. So this would be for ongoing uh, exposure 
uh, for staff when they, we've been working on a difficult case, maybe over the course of weeks, months. Uh, we've even gone well over a year with some cases. Um, the purpose of these regular sessions, it's not to you know, complain or place blame, um, but it's rather an opportunity for frontline staff to engage in that cathartic ventilation, uh, promote an environment of openness, mutual appreciation for the difficulties at hand. These um, discussions are helpful in allowing further processing for the day-to-day -day struggles of working with a difficult case, uh, creating a sense that that individual staff are not alone in their experiences and emotions. They recognize that in each other. Uh, it provides an avenue for staff to support each other and a way for uh, management to show their support for frontline staff as it sometimes uh, is identified through them that we need to maybe do a check-in. Even though there's an understanding that that have to continue to work within a difficult situation because the case is ongoing. The support offered by individuals and the group as a whole provides a true appreciation for the daily struggles uh, frontline staff face daily. So this next um, slide, we're kind of looking at uh, a program that's new to our unit in the last uh, year and a bit, but it's um, donation after cardiac um, death or after circulatory death. And so it was a new program for us and in, in being in a pediatric centering, cent center, very um, distressing on many levels, just even leading up to uh, going ahead with with a donation case. So we were able to provide pre-crisis uh, preparation. So we were um, providing accurate information, giving uh, a question and answer opportunity and addressing uh, individual concerns. This prevented rumors about what was going on, what was happening, uh, hallway conversations, and then the ability to move forward as a unified team with a shared purpose. After um, the donation, um, we were able to provide a diffusing immediately. And we did this through two different uh, groups. We had CISM diffusings for the uh, PICU team and then a separate one for the OR team immediately after procedures because they were in different um, parts of a case and so they had different needs to be met. Um, and then the teams were able to go about the rest of their day with their tasks because the OR had to continue on with the rest of their cases and our ICU had to go on caring for the rest of our um, patients in our ICU as well. We scheduled a debrief um, shortly after, so it was within two weeks, and that was open for everybody to come. So the OR staff, PICU uh, staff, and then as well as including the organ donation team. Um, so it was really um, addressed at all levels, right from the beginning to the end of the case. Um, CISM now is built into our policies around organ donation, uh, as well as we're looking at other policies within the site, um, having our team being accessed uh, as needed and just being able to identify how to access us uh, when things do arise. I'm going to turn it over to um, Emma Foles, and she's going to kind of discuss a little bit of, about how this program has worked at our site. Thank you, Renee. So the, I just want to talk a little bit about um, how we, this program uh, began at ACH and um, the impetus for it. So in 2010, um, specifically within the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit here at Alberta Children's Hospital, um, we did have quite a lot of staff turnover. Um, we had staff reporting that there was poor morale. And, and sorry about that, we just having some sound problems. So we had some, we had some uh, staff reporting that they had had uh, some poor morale and higher turnover and that kind of thing. Um, so some of the interventions that they thought would be helpful would be generalised culture building and things within the PICE, um, but then as well specifically a forum to um, offend about difficult situations within the PIC, lots of things that Renee had talked about previously, such as, um, you know, death of patients, um, following resuscitation events, um, following difficult cases um, ethically and morally and that kind of thing. And so one of the many interventions that we decided to pursue was CASM. Uh, we did some research um, across the world in terms of other CASM programs and their existence and that kind of thing. Um, 
And really, as Renee said, predominantly this has started in um, fire and police and that kind of thing. And it was just sort of starting to make its way into more acute care health settings. And so um, we did some research. At that time, there was an international um, critical incident stress foundation that existed in the United States. Uh, the Canadian one um, was on a bit of a pause at that time. And so we were able to bring some facilitators up from the US to provide initial training to our staff and trained a multidisciplinary team, specifically just within the PIC and a few people from the emergency department. And so we had uh, social workers, some spiritual care advisors, a physician, um, some nurses, I think respiratory therapists at that time as well, um, just sort of started a smaller team and started to debrief um, specific incidences within the PIC and then found that, you know, the more we used it, the more we used it kind of thing. And so, um, uh, you know, people became more comfortable with the process and found um, different ways to access it. The program became so successful that we then had other teams within the site who were wishing to access and so they would make requests to us and we were able to support that um, but then decided that really um, found a lot of value in having not just peer-to-peer -peer debriefing in terms of having RNs debrief RNs or um, social work debrief social work so to speak but also having staff from within that particular unit um, who were not directly involved in that case specifically um, to help debrief the teams. And so we were able to then bring some facilitators from the Canadian Institute for Stress Management um, here to provide some more training. And so we chose to train at least two members of staff from each of the inpatient units, of which there's four at ACH, from the emergency department, from the OR and from the NICU, um, as well as additional um, spiritual care advisors and social workers at that time. And so then developed um, what we understand to be the first acute uh, acute care site CASM program in Canada um, and really from there have found more and more um, opportunity for its use across the site um, particularly in I would say the emergency department and OR but in patient units and the NIC as well and so looking forward in order to um, make our program more sustainable um, we have three facilitators on site who we have trained um, to be able to facilitate the course ourselves. So this would avoid bringing in external facilitators um, and needing to pay for travel and that kind of thing. So we do have three staff who now can provide training for individual um, CASM as well as group CASM. Um, so flipping forward to 2016 when we, you know, evaluated the program, um, specifically within the PIC, um, looking back from 2010 to 2016, we found that um, we did have a drop in our vacant positions by 75%, um, so that we saw that as a real improvement in our turnover. And as well as that, we decreased our staff sick hours by 46%, and that was um, between 2015 and 2016. Um, of course, these things can be attributed to other factors, um, more than just the CASM program, but staff really report that um, this was quite instrumental in their ability to stay on, their ability to cope. Um, their ability to not feel burned out and just um, feel supported by each other. And so the feedback as well is that it's actually made a difference just in the day-to-day -day, um, operations and day-to-day -day relationships within the PIC where um, staff feel more sort of trusting of each other and the ability to be more vulnerable, which then invokes more trust with each other, um, not just in the CASM debrief setting, um, but just day-to-day -day on the unit. I think it's important to mention as well that um, we actually managers, and I am a manager, um, we don't sit in on the debriefs. Um, we only have staff who are directly involved in that particular patient situation attend those specific debriefs. Um, we don't really want people sort of um, watching from the sidelines, so to speak. And then within the literature, it's recommended that um, managers as well don't attend, um, not because... Um, we wouldn't add value necessarily, but we wouldn't want to perhaps think that, you know what, maybe I won't offer that nurse some extra shifts this week because she seems to be not doing well. We want to take that out of the equation. And so we don't actually have um, that there. Um, so really, I think what we're able to do is um, normalize people's feelings. I think when we come into work every day um, in pediatric health care and specifically within in intensive care unit setting, um, what we think is normal is actually quite abnormal. The patients and families that we work with and what they're experiencing um, is actually fairly abnormal and we need to find a way to cope with that. 
Um, some additional strategies that we have incorporated within the unit um, to provide a healthy workplace, uh, providing a, a, a quiet space for staff to go to, um, that's an accreditation standard. Um, encouraging self-care and certainly through the CASM debriefing process, um, staff are offered some resources to promote their own self-care. Um, sometimes needing time away from the unit. And so, you know, one, one example would be um, a nurse within the past couple of years who um, happened to be on for three out of three shifts in a row who um, cared for three different children or indirectly cared for three different children who unfortunately passed away um, and came to us and just said, you know what, like I just, I don't think I can come in for the next shift. And we were able to adjust things so that um, he could have that time away that he needed. Um, and then... Um, supporting the CISM program for staff is a big one. So we have some quotes here from staff um, we wanted to share with you all. Um, we, um, as we're evaluating the program, just wanted to kind of get a sense from people. We have some good numbers and we have some good informal feedback around how successful this is, but specifically some quotes from staff. So the first one's from a respiratory therapist who says, acute care at Alberta Children's Hospital can be a, an emotionally draining environment, an experience we face repeatedly in our quest to achieve the best patient outcomes. Yet we are all too often faced with difficult cases that challenge us to perform exceptional patient care while our emotional health is jeopardized. Professions in caring too often neglect to care for the caregiver. Staff require a safe forum to debrief and share emotions that previously were left unattended and eroded our well-being. Uh, and then the next one is from a CASM team member. So the CASM program supports physician and residents who traditionally have been expected to be a tower of strength for operational staff during times of crisis or moral distress. A type of debrief happened with a group of residents after they completed their residency block in the PIC. It was an initiative started after quite a few residents were feeling stressed about the things they had experienced during their current PIC training block, but also past blocks that had happened in the PIC. During this debrief or check-in, the four residents that attended were in different stages of their residency. One of the most senior residents who worked adult emergency expressed her distress towards dealing with the chronic patients that the PIC sees regularly. The residents in this forum all supported the one resident specializing in adult care. There was so much respect for her feelings towards the types of patients seen in PICU. Many tears were shed as they shared stories of the difficulties they had seen. It was clear the compassion that they showed towards each other. And the last one is from a respiratory therapist. So CASM is able to provide staff acknowledgement and situational support required to maintain a cohesive healthcare team. CISM allows for information sharing and often represents a starting point for the healing process to occur. Moral distress is minimized, grief is acknowledged, and the emotional weight of the tragedy is lessened. We are fortunate to have such an incredible service at Alberta Children's Hospital. And we'd just like to show a final video um, which really uh, shows how do we go on. How do we go on? When every single day our beliefs are challenged. When we question our own decisions. How do we go on when we look at our own children and know that sometimes there's nothing that can be done? How can we protect our children when we've just seen another die? We learn to accept and we learn to cope. We find distractions, a pet, a jog in the park, a vacation, we find sanctuaries. For some, it's religion. Others, their family. Competence can give strength. Resources can give hope. We have hope. And sometimes that's all we need. So we just like to give some credits um, for the videos that we just showed who were involved in the making of this film. So this comes from some of our colleagues here within Alberta Health Services, um, specifically Daniel Garris, um, who's an intensivist at the Stollery Children's Hospital in Alberta, um, and worked with his colleagues to create um, this film, which was also, I think, um, shown on this forum previously, called Just Keep Breathing. And this was part of a CAHRA funded research into moral distress amongst specifically pediatric intensive care unit teams um, and had some support from the Arnold P. Gold Foundation. Um, and so the, the producers of this were Wendy Austin and shown here on the screen, Daniel Garros, um, Pamela Brett-McLean, Eric Goebel and Timothy Anderson. 
and it was really um, a neat way to show um, uh, the you know portraying the realities that we face every day working in a children's hospital. So thank you. Finally, here's our contact information. Um, Renee and I are more than uh, more than willing to answer some questions, or if you're interested in getting your own program started within your own pediatric facilities, um, we'd be more than happy to help you along the way. Thank you. All right. So uh, thank you for the great presentation. I mean, that was uh, there were some great videos and and lots of resources there that you've identified that you know, as as you said, for those of you out there who are interested in creating a similar program, uh, certainly lots of experience and information here from Renee and Emma. So thank you for that. Uh, this is your chance now, uh, as uh, our audience, to ask any questions that you might have. Please do type them into the question box uh, at any time. Uh, we did have some questions that have already come in. Um, the first one came in was. Uh, it was from Nancy, and she's just sort of referencing a quote from the uh, Department of National Defense's website in relation to the military experience. And, and the, their website says, most troops will experience some reaction after exposure to a potentially traumatizing event, but will recover using their own coping strategies. Routine use of psychological debriefings is no longer considered best practice. She was just wondering if you had any comments on that, and where does CISM fit in relation to, she uses the acronym AIR, I'm not sure I know what that means, but she says, or physical, uh, psychological first aid, and you did mention psychological first aid at one point. So just if you, if you have any comments about the psychological debriefings no longer being best practice and where, where your CISM program would fit in relation to that. Um, I can't really speak to the um, maybe programs that they used or in the military and and what they're recommending. Um, but we do know that uh, we've seen that within uh, the healthcare organization as well, where if there's a time frame where people thought, uh, you know, maybe this isn't the best um, tactic to use. We, we're looking at our, at different services and just doing immediate uh, referrals to an employee family assistance program. Um, for counseling and, and whatnot. Um, what we found is peer-to-peer -peer support uh, just brings that extra level of um, support and um, encouragement for wellness right immediately after or during a situation. And the effects of it um, are seen definitely throughout. Um, so that that's that psychological first aid that I was speaking to. You're really just just looking at that first layer, um, you know, just scratching the surface really of what's going on, but then being able to identify and get early intervention started if needed. Um, I do I, I can actually make a comment in regards to the military um, stance on that. And there was some studies done. There is lots of literature, as I said. Um, but there was um, studies done and that tried to um, show the ineffectiveness um, of diffusings, debriefings, uh, CISM tactics. But the way that the research was done, it actually looked at individuals um, and not group and looked at groups as individuals. And so they're very, very different. So you have to be careful of the um, research that's been done out there and really um, read those articles uh, Christine is asking, uh, just from a organizational perspective, who has oversight of the team, and how are the, how are the teams uh, the team supported? Um, and I, I, th I think she's asking, sort of, is it perhaps is this under which department within the hospital would this fall? Perhaps is it more of a risk management thing, occupational health and safety, or sort of in what are human resources, et cetera? What where where would this program fall? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, to be honest, it's sort of multifaceted. I think because the program organically came out of the PIC, um, the main sort of management or leadership oversight of the team members themselves and the program itself um, is the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit Manager. Um, but certainly it's well supported by our executive team leadership. Um, we have worked with occupational health and safety and with our human resources colleagues as well to make sure that um, what we're doing, we're going about it in the right way and making sure that we're also offering other um, resources that are available through the organization, um, through places like human resources or EFAP, as Renee mentioned, and that kind of thing. Um, but as well as that, it's quite collaborative across the site, um, manager to manager, department to department, because we do have staff um, trained as facilitators from other programs. Um, so, yeah, I would say that it does, you know, it's supported ultimately by our executive leadership, which would be both operational leadership and physician leadership. Um, but the day-to-day -day oversight would sit at the pediatric intensive care unit level. 
um, but then with lots of input from colleagues um, from those other areas. Right. Uh, David is saying that uh, many care providers feel that they do not need such interventions because we have all been there, we are, we're tough, et cetera. How did you overcome those kinds of perceptions to get people to participate in these in this program? So the program is really much, very much a voluntary program. Um, no one is um, forced into this and it is not for some people. Like I think our experience is that not everybody wants to participate in this. Um, a lot of people have really great um, resiliency and great self-coping strategies um, that they already use at home and don't necessarily feel the need for the individual or group intervention. Um, as well as that, um, some people have other ways um, of coping and that kind of thing. So I think because it's a voluntary program, we're really just harnessing those people that um, do find it valuable and do find it useful. Um, and I think some staff feel the need to come to some debriefings and others not. Do you have anything to add to that, Renee? Um, yeah, I think exactly what Emma said, it, it is, it's voluntary. Um, and over the years, it's really changed our culture in the ICU. And so you might not, as an individual, feel like you need to go, but maybe you recognize symptoms in your colleagues or your coworkers, um, and you're worried about them. And so that's really the biggest thing is people will come to us and say, you know what, maybe we need to do a debrief around such and such case because uh, I'm worried about so-and-so. Or can you check in with, with my colleague? Um, so that's where that one-to-one -one really happens quite a bit. Um, as well, as Emma mentioned, some situations don't evoke the um, stress responses or the negative stress responses um, for an individual at certain times, but then a case will come up and it does. And, and we do see those uh, people attend um, at different times. And some attend to support their colleagues, really. Uh, Nancy's asking if your approach is consistent with approaches outlined by the Alberta Critical Incident Advisory Council's documentation around CISM best practices for training. Uh, I can't say that I'm aware of that um, document or what's outlined in it. So that'd be something for me to look into. Mm -hmm. right. We are aligned with the Canadian Institute for Critical Incident Stress Management and have taken our sort of direction and things from, from that group. All right. Um, when beginning the program, did past stresses need to be, you know, quote unquote, unpacked and debriefed first? Is that part of the process? Um, we really just answered it case by case. Um, but those questions do come up or people, you know, initially when they were getting involved and then maybe they'd never been in a situation, uh, a debrief situation before, um, those histories do come out. But if we're there for a, to for a certain topic, then we try to keep it focused on that, but then also explore with that individual because every individual has a different caseload. And so um, we would discuss that or explore it on an individual um, level, unless the whole group was identifying that this case really resonated with something from their past that they were all involved in. All right. Um, so the next question is asking, has your emergency department ever used the CISM in conjunction with first responders who may have brought in a child that was a difficult case for them and for the emergency department personnel? If that has happened, how did it go and how long after the patient was brought in did the debrief take place? Days, weeks after autopsy, et cetera? Um, so as I mentioned before, the every case is individual. Um, we take that call based, you know, as soon as staff come to us with, with a, a request or a need. And so, or a it's identified that it might be something that's going to be needed. Um, so really we intervene at different points depending on um, what what the need is from staff. And so what gets brought to our attention. And sometimes it is weeks after an event because it hasn't been recognized that it's been uh, causing any stressful symptoms. 
And as far as I know, we haven't um, debriefed emergency department staff along with EMS. Um, we have had some external people such as um, we have like a donor coordinator um, that works within the Calgary zone um, to um, help assist with the process of um, organ donation. And I think that some of their staff were included on debriefs during organ donation cases. Um, just, just to add on to that, we we don't join those groups together for specific reasons. Um, we've been they've been involved at different stages of uh, a case, and so you still need to think of each group as a homogeneous uh, group. So you'd really want to debrief the the uh, ambulance team maybe together by themselves, um, emergency crew you know, with, with them and then ICU by themselves or whichever other unit was used. Sometimes you, you look at a bigger debrief, but you don't get uh, for, for everybody to be involved. And that's really more of an informational debrief. And so you're going through with those um, just hitting kind of the highlights and maybe it's more information that people need and they just need that overall medical uh, management picture. And so that's where that would be more effective. Uh, if the team was immediately involved, uh, EMS and Emerge can usually work together as well as maybe the transport team if it involved people from PICU. It just depends on the part that you're looking at debriefing. We don't want to provide or open up uh, secondary trauma to those individuals that maybe weren't part of a uh, a case that just doesn't need to be reviewed by others. Um, a couple of people asked about sort of uh, patient and family engagement kinds of issues. Uh, you know, we use the language a lot around patients and family or families are part of the care team and you're using language around the, you know, the, the team, et cetera. Do you, well, A, is there any role for families in this process uh, with your current pro program, do you foresee, have you ever heard of in any way engaging f family members in this sort of debriefing process? Maybe not at the beginning, as you, you mentioned a number of interventions, so you only went through a few. Is there, is there Do any of those interventions involve engaging uh, family members at any point in this process? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we haven't, we have not involved any families in these processes. And as far as we know, there are not any processes that exist to involve patients and families um, in this kind of debriefing. So not not something that we have done, not something that we plan to forge ahead with, um, without learning from um, some kind of experts in that field, or um, if that's something that that's created. Um. And Jamie's asking, she's, or he's suggesting you mentioned that this program was more beneficial than utilizing an employee assistance program or counselors. Can you just expand on the difference that you found in your center between the CISM program and using more traditional counselors or employee assistance programs? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think for the individual um, debriefing, certainly staff can access EFAP. And there are some staff that do that and find that beneficial. Um, but the reports from those staff is that it's they feel like it's not the same experience speaking to a stranger over the phone who doesn't necessarily have a healthcare background, who, who doesn't sort of get it is the language that they use. And as well for the group debriefings, um, we can access EFAP facilitators to come um, through the organisation um, to our site to run group debriefs and we had trialled that in the past. Um, but again, the experience is felt to be different where um, there's a stranger in the room. You don't already have that um, rapport and trust that you would have with your colleagues during a peer-to-peer peer -to -peer, peer -to -peer debrief. Um, and as well, because they don't have a healthcare background, they don't necessarily um, navigate the conversation in the same way. And so staff have reported that generally um, they feel it's more beneficial to have a, a colleague um, and more of a peer-to-peer -peer style debriefing. With that, I think we have uh, gone through all of the questions that came in from the audience. So thank you uh, to the audience for uh, for uh, your participation and for all of that input. Uh, so before we wrap up, we do we are, we are pretty much out of time here. So uh, before we uh, leave the audience, is there any sort of closing messages or key messages you'd like to leave the audience with before we sign off? Um, well, just thanks very much for uh, listening to our presentation. Um, and really, if there's any way that we could help promote this uh, information in your areas, we'd be more than happy to discuss that. Um, it really um, 
truly has found a, a, a mark in our uh, site uh, for support for staff. And it's uh, immediately accessed and, um, and staff seem to appreciate it. So we think it's a good thing. And I would just add to that as well that um, I think the success of this program has been that it was developed from grassroots level. And so this really came from the ground up um, in a very sort of organic way. And we have we do have a site-wide program now, but certainly um, it was something that the frontline staff um, felt was important and they were really the key um, leaders in developing the program and then spreading the program. All right. Well, thank you uh, once again uh, to both of you. A, really a fantastic presentation and a fantastic program and that ho the whole sort of grassroots nature of it, I think, really comes through. You've really sort of made it your own in Alberta there and really, uh, you know, applied it to uh, to your own uh, sort of context there, which I think is just, it's fantastic. And, and certainly lots of lessons for the rest of the audience here to learn and take back to their own organizations. So uh, so thank you very much for uh, for the great presentation. Uh, we do our web webinars every Wednesday, usually at 11 a.m. Eastern time. And it's always great when you can watch live uh, as the questions and the conversations conversation really enrich the discussion. But uh, when you can't watch live, we do record these sessions and make them available after the fact on the Knowledge Exchange Network at uh, ken.com. CAFSI.org. That's ken.cafsi.org. Uh, our next webinar uh, next week uh, on March 7th, uh, uh, we will once again uh, hear from our one of CAFSI's very own communities of practice, this time our community of practice in children's pain. Uh, and this time we're going to be talking about pediatric chronic pain and, and have an introduction to the uh, CAFSI chronic pain toolkit and using a number of case studies. Uh, so in that session, we're going to be talking about what is chronic pain common types of chronic pain in children, signs, symptoms. As a primary clinician, what can you do to help support patients for uh, and families with chronic pain? Uh, what is a chronic pain clinic and how to refer and access to services, et cetera, for, uh, for chronic pain and resources that they can share with families? Um, so that's a great uh, opportunity to learn about a very practical toolkit and uh, for a very challenging uh, issue of, of chronic pain in children. And following that webinar, we do have a, a couple of weeks off. We have a number of, we have to accommodate the various March breaks across the country. Of course, we can't uh, all agree on the same week. So uh, we do have a, a few weeks off after next week's webinar. Um, so thanks again uh, for joining us today. Uh, a great presentation coming up next week. Uh, hopefully you'll enjoy the little uh, bit of a break that we uh, have planned for the next few weeks and we'll see you back here. Bye everyone.